This is Group 5's midterm demo sponsored by Ocean Insights. Firstly, this presentation will go over the contaminants that we plan to detect with our system. Our device will be capable of detecting the presence and identifying contaminants that can be commonly found in water. Now, obviously, it's important to be able to distinguish between various contaminant types so that wastewater treatment plants are able to better gauge their treatment options. Alternative methods can include GCMS or gas chromatography mass spectrometry, which can be pretty expensive, time consuming, and also destroys the sample while it is being measured. By using Raman spectroscopy, we can non-invasively identify what contaminant lies within the water. And for the purposes of this design, we will demonstrate the detection and identification of a variety of water-soluble contaminants from different backgrounds. Our spectrometer should be high throughput, which means it can collect a lot of light. This would make it attractive for Raman spectroscopy, since Raman scattered signals tend to be weak. Our spectral range will be from 785 nanometers up to 885 nanometers. This should be able to account for the types of water contaminants that we intend to measure. This is our engineering specifications table. This table has been updated from the last one to show more specifications and how will they be implemented into our design. The three highlighted is what we'll be showing in our final demo. The basic idea behind Raman spectroscopy is that when laser light excites a sample, not only will the laser wavelength scatter off of it, but so will a frequency shifted or wavelength shifted signal as well. And that is all this formula illustrates. You can either plot the spectrum in terms of frequency or Raman shift, or you can plot it in terms of wavelength. The samples we intend to measure are magnesium sulfate, ammonium nitrate, and potassium perchlorate. Ammonium nitrate is commonly used as a fertilizer in agriculture. In Raman spectroscopy, it has a distinct 1041 inverse centimeter peak. When using a 785 nanometer laser, this corresponds to a 854 nanometer Raman wavelength. Magnesium sulfate occurs naturally and is found in groundwater, or can be used as an additive for food. Though it's not federally enforced, the EPA does have a maximum contaminant level recommendation of 250 milligrams per liter. The Raman shift range is from 982 inverse centimeters to 1052 inverse centimeters. When using a laser wavelength of 785 nanometers, 982 inverse centimeters corresponds to 850 nanometer Raman wavelength and a 1052 inverse centimeter shift would correspond to an 856 nanometer peak. Potassium perchlorate is another sample whose Raman spectrum we would like to acquire. Perchlorates are toxic chemicals that are used in rocket fuel or explosive road flares and can actually interfere with thyroid hormone production. These chemicals can come from military and industrial sites and often dissolve and seep into groundwater. Now, according to the Connecticut Department of Public Health, the maximum contaminant level for several states is two to six micrograms per liter. The Raman spectrum exhibits bands from 630 inverse centimeters to 1130 inverse centimeters, which corresponds to Raman peaks of 825 nanometers and 861 nanometers, respectively. Here's the housing for several components, including the spectrometer, laser, PCB for temperature and humidity sensing, as well as the onboard computer. Currently, our spectrometer is incomplete due to parts not having had arrived yet, namely our collimator, which will be mounted onto the cage at the fiber side, as well as our imaging optics to minify the fringes on the detector. These parts are expected to arrive very soon so that we may be able to move forward with general alignment and begin testing with various light sources. For the time we have remaining, we will spend time ensuring that the illumination system is properly aligned as well as our spectrometer. We plan to add a translational mount for our gratings to ensure that the first diffracted orders are properly recombining. We also plan to adjust the positions of the imaging optics within our designed lens tube, and mounting this as well as the collimator, and eventually a beam expander to the cage system that our spectrometer uses. 
We plan to optimize various aspects throughout the entire system, troubleshooting our electronics and power supplies as well. Throughout July, we will spend time testing our measurements of the aforementioned chemicals and ensuring that we meet spec for resolution as well as spectral range. This is our overall view of our spectrometer. Not all the parts have come in yet, so we just have to work with what we got. So right here we have an alignment laser, which is going to align the whole system for us. Um, as you saw in the CDR, these are our two gratings that we have. This is our beam splitter. And this is how we're going to check for fringes for right now until we get a camera working and everything hooked up. So like I said, so the laser will go through here. Right here in the space is supposed to be a collimator, which is going to collimate the light onto this beam splitter. These two diffraction gratings will then be retroflected upon each other, which will then go through a focusing lens, which we don't have right now. And then the focusing lens will be onto the detector, and the detector will image the um, the fringes, which will look like a barcode onto the detector or the camera. And then the detector will be connected to a GUI, which will then have the results in MATLAB. So the samples will be implemented into the HSS by the laser light scattering off the samples, and those scatter light will be um, brought into the SHS and interface with MATLAB. These two next slides are going to be an introduction to what we're going to see in the demo video uh, based on the engineering um, requirements. So in this one, we're going to talk about the MCU communication. We're going to use the MSP430 FR6989. It's going to be programmed by via the development board by um, Spy by Wire Technology. We're going to be doing this by taking out the jump wires within the development boards and that connect the MCU that is integrated in that same board. And then we're going to connect those into our own custom PCB that has our own um, MCU within it. The code is then flashed using the Code Composer Studio. Um, and we require a couple of um, passive components along uh, short wires for uh, fast paced reliable transfer and a common ground and power supply, which we can also see uh, in the shown picture and we will also see in the video. Uh, the MCU to PC communication is going to be done by isolating the digital and analog channels within our um, PCB and it uses a USB and mini USB uh, cable. For the temperature and humidity sensor, we're using the HIH630. It communicates with the MCU via I2C protocol. This data is sent from the sensor uh, in four bytes that are requested by the MCU using the standard 0 h 27 address of the sensor, which is given by the manufacturer. Byte 1 and the first half of byte 2 contain the humidity value, and the second half of byte 2 and byte 3 contain the temperature data. Byte 4 is only used as a status bit. Now, this raw data, which is obtained for the by the MCU, is then converted uh, via equations that are given in the data sheet of the chip. Uh, and then the equations are looked like this into the C code. And we will see more as we see the mid-term demonstration. We have the PCB right here. We have these four pins connected to the SBWTCK, SBWTDIO the 3v3 pin and the ground pin to the development board we're using this for the purpose of programming but since we don't have the uh, power supply connector at the moment we are also using it for powering up uh, the 3.3 side of the board uh, the 3.3 side we also have the um, the humidity sensor and the microcontroller we're using the M msp430 fr 6989 right here and we can see right here in the laptop that we can we are running the code and it is flashing the code onto the pcb uh, as for the pcb we can see that um, the power works as if we connect the ground and the uh, power supply we get it on the multimeter um, we, on this side we have the the usb connection that would be connected also into the computer this would work for uh, without the need of the development board, we will connect it to the computer and send the information that we get from the microcontroller. We have the temperature sensor right here, the latch connector, 
uh, and then we have the power supply that will be um, converted down into a 12 volt rail and a 3.3 volt rail right here. The 12 volt rail will connect to the uh, fan that is right here. We still have to connect it, but since we don't have the uh, main PSU, we don't have the need to. So this is our uh, user interface. It's just a prototype at the moment. Um, but the basics of it are that we're able to control whether or not the laser is turned on and turned off. Uh, we demonstrated that in the demo for the uh, XY table and this laser right here. Um, but so here you have the three major components, laser spectrometer motor that you can connect and disconnect. Uh, these, depending on what USB port you have it plugged into your computer, you'll be able to select that using this drop down menu. Um, you'll have to determine it using uh, the device manager that you can see right here. Um, but essentially the point of this software is to be able to control it, run the spectrometer uh, for whatever analysis you have. The samples will be in this little well plate. Um, and then the well plates will be above this laser. Uh, the laser will shoot through the sample and uh, the camera will capture the image, and eventually the uh, image will be translated uh, through Fourier transforms to be able to get uh, peaks at certain frequencies depending on what uh, is in that um, sample. So this is our uh, laser that we're gonna be using, uh, Oxius uh, Lasers model. Uh, we can see it right now, it appears in uh, our Oxius Lasers tools on uh, COM port three. So we're just gonna go in our uh, little User program nice. here that uh, our brother Sebastian cooked up. We're just gonna go to the initialize and we're gonna connect to the laser. And uh, as you can see, you can go up here, our laser setup, we're gonna turn emission on. Then we're gonna open the shutter as well. And uh, if all goes well, here's our uh, enclosure able to see our laser emitting right there. Now we're gonna turn it off and uh, our laser will be off and uh, that's how we will be operating.